First you get paid for what you do, then you get paid for what you know, and then you get paid for who you grow. Half of my life, or even up until maybe 10 years ago, I was chasing success all the time, and it's exhausting. As we're before, it felt like always like a competition. Things change in your, in your beliefs and your values and your standards, hopefully for the better. Before this episode starts, I have a small favor I need to ask you. Since the channel started, over 90% of those that have watched have not subscribed. So if you liked any of my podcast episodes or any of the content on this channel, please hit the subscribe button down below. It helps the channel grow. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests. Thank you and enjoy this episode. It doesn't come down to who has the most talent or intelligence. It doesn't come down to who is willing to make the choices that, that others are not willing to make. Like who is willing to shoot basketball in the dark when everyone else is asleep? Who is willing to prepare for more for a job interview? Who is willing to practice their speech 10 times more than anyone else? All are choices we make. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? And where did that come from? I think it, uh, thanks so much for having me uh, on, on the podcast, Christy. I think it just comes from a little bit of my background, uh, not being the most talented or the first pick, you know, when you're in, when you're in school or in class or, uh, you know, when the teams get lined up, I, I wasn't always the first pick. I was always middle to last. So um, I think maybe that was where that ambition or that seed was planted, where I thought, you know, if I want to be one of the first picks uh, or want to be in the, the the football team, rugby team, whatever it may be, I'd have to work harder. I'd have to use what I had. So um, it was one of the inspirations to me writing my second book, Champion Minded, was um, you know, being being brilliant at at the basics and being brilliant at the things that require no no talent, and you know, like it or not, in life we all get off to a different start. Uh, you know, uh, you can't choose your parents, you can't choose your genetics, you can't choose where you were born. So some of us have had an advantage over others, like it like it or not. And it's a subject sometimes I can bring up that can be controversial, which I, I don't necessarily like controversial conversations are like d debates and, and hearing other sides, but um, we're not all given the same start. Uh, I never got to go to college myself. So uh, my, my highest education is high school, but I knew that if I wanted to succeed, uh, I would need to outwork. Um, others have a better attitude, get there early, stay longer. Um, and these these are things that I've, I've been able to do from a young age in my jobs that I worked as well of the ability to climb the ladder and get ahead in life is uh, giving more than what's been asked of you. Um, uh, you know, I have a quote as well. I have many quotes, but one of, one of my favorite ones is um, the five percenters. And what are the five percenters? They're the ones that are willing to do the extra work. They're willing to do more than what's been asked of them. Those are the ones that, that get ahead. So, to answer your question in a very long-winded way, I would say that's where uh, where it all started for me. So how did your journey begin? You kind of elaborated on your upbringing just then, but how did your the steps towards where you are proceed? You mentioned school and, and kind of lifestyle yeah, well, at a young yeah, age. How did that I happen? Was, I was born on the same side of the world as you. I was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Um, and, and I left there when I was five, um, it was my parents' choice. Of course, I wasn't making decisions at five years old of where we were going to live. So my parents and my, me and my three brothers, we, uh, headed off to South Africa. So that's really where I was brought up. Of course, being a very Southern hemisphere, uh, or, or it being a Southern hemisphere country, sorry, it's a very sporty, um, uh, environment as well. So my love for sports was, was growing there. There would always be, uh, World Cups and and Wimbledon tennis matches going on in our backyard. Uh, of course, fights with the brothers and so on and so forth. And I was the youngest, so I had to uh, grow up quickly. Uh, and I would get beat up all the time. So, uh, yeah, that that's really where it started. Um, played a lot of sports in school. Probably played sometimes six, seven sports in a season. Uh, I just loved competing, loved being around others, loved wor uh, working together in, in a team. Um, even though I did um, enjoy individual sports as well, I was a pretty de decent tennis junior as well, um, and then went into into duathlon, which is running and, and biking. So yeah, all my life has been about sports. Um, with regards to my evolution of myself, and if you have a look at my books, I'm on. I, I just wrote my sixth book now. It's been a a timeline of my 
life and my career as well of going from being an athlete into coaching uh and now into to leadership and culture so you know my books have gone along that that route as well and one of the ways i've written books is actually i don't consider myself an expert i actually learn by writing down so when i read a book i take notes i highlight with i always say a yellow highlighter and then after i've read that book i will go i will write down in a notebook the uh the things i've highlighted so those are the important things that stuck out for me and the things i want to remember for example in fact i i keep a notebook with me all the time uh to to write down because you you can't remember everything um so writing those books has been about my journey as well so to say and and you know i thought you know what while i'm learning this and while i'm discovering this and, and as we speak i'm still learning and i always will be um i'll always be writing things down and and why not share it with others Mm -hmm. have you come across a book or an author called tiago forte he mentions developing a second brain and the importance of making notes and and kind of storing well, information I, I from experience with a last with a last name like that forte is strong in italian then uh <laughs> I, that sounds like a good a good option but i so, haven't so, I, i'm always i'm always love hearing about new books and and so on yeah. so uh i'll check that out yeah it was a, it was a, something i'd come across on audiobooks but it, it emphasizes your point around uh making notes and kind of uh collecting experiences via that way um so let's dig deep really around this champion minded because it's something that I'm very intrigued in and and I've had a look at your work so how do you develop a champion minded philosophy then how do these ideas come about you mentioned your experiences playing and and, and being an athlete in performance uh that transition into performance in terms of your career talk to me about the ideas within that and some of the experiences that I've I've shaped this book to to inspire and, and lead others. I think it's an accumulation of just all the years of being an athlete uh, uh, and, and being a coach and now being a consultant and mentor. Um, I think that's the, the, the path I've been on. You know, first you get paid for what you do, then you get paid for what you know, and then you get paid for who you grow. And I'm in that that phase right now of 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 growing others, which is a massive part of my purpose as well. But to answer your question, how do you grow a champion's mindset? It's like any other skill. How do you learn how to play golf? How do you learn how to play the piano? How do you become uh, a, a better in any particular areas is practice and learning and research and asking a lot of questions and practicing a lot. Uh, that is how you become, that's how you develop your mind as well. So you've got to be deliberate about it. You've got to be, uh, you've got to have goals when it comes to your mindset as well. So, you know, I consult world-class and Olympic athletes and I always tell them, you know, uh, regardless of what your session is for that day, you've got to have at least one mindset goal. What could that be? That could be up uh, today. I'm going to be uh, conscious about my self-talk today. I'm going to be conscious maybe about my body language today. I'm maybe going to be more conscious about the way I react after a mistake. Uh, or the way I think after a mistake. So that is a mindset goal. And of course, you know, uh, you've got to evaluate as well. And and what I ask them to do is after a session, and this is not just athletes, this, this could be a CEO, or this could be um, even, even you, for example, after your podcast is evaluate yourself and how you did today, how you found your, your interaction has, how your questions were, how your, how the response was, for example, was, was there flow? Was it interesting? Um, that is how you develop a champion's a mindset. You know, a champion is the, the word champion is sometimes always around sports. And a champion is not just an athlete. A champion is somebody that's um, uh, set out to be the best they can be. You know, the, the good old John Wooden quote as well is, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly, but he basically says, you know, be the best you can be. That's all you, all you can do. And I think, uh, Christy, it, it leads me on to what I'm really diving into a lot at the moment, and, and I'm on to my, my seventh book as well, is don't strive for success, strive for excellence. And you might be saying, well, what does that mean exactly, Alistair? Well, success to me is more external, more more on the outer. So we can look at success as, uh, as fame, money, prestige, title, uh, all these things that we might see on, on Instagram, for example, and then think to ourselves, well, what's wrong with me? I'm a failure. Why don't I have 100,000 followers? Why don't I have uh, a, a nice uh, Ferrari or whatever it may be? So we're given this 
this wrong perception about success. And of course, all of us have got to define what success is for us. Excellence, on the other hand, is more about the process, the journey. Uh, excellence is more about uh, uh, helping others, growing others, for example. So um, th that, that for me has been become very important is that I would say in the first half of my life or even up until maybe 10 years ago, I was chasing success all the time and it's exhausting. It's exhausting is you're always chasing that and there's no finish line and that becomes exhausting. It's almost like you running a marathon or running it, someone telling you to run, but you don't know where the finish line is and you keep running. Uh, for me, excellence is an everyday process is doing the best I can today, setting mini goals for my, myself, developing good habits, developing good routines and, uh, and, 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 and evaluating at the end of the day. Uh, I ask myself three questions. What did I do well today? What could I have done better today? And who did I make better today? Those three simple questions. So, um, yeah, for me, the the pursuit of excellence has been um, been the main thing. And I can tell you from my experience, I feel a lot happier. I feel a lot more fulfilled and a lot more joy in what I do every day. As we're before, it felt like always like a competition. So, so what I'm gathering is, self-awareness and self-reflection is kind of the catalyst in terms of being Absolutely. the best you can and being a being the best you can be is that is that what yeah. you're, you're trying to say in a short absolute you know, way yeah so so what is self-awareness self-awareness you know we've got to define what things are as well is your ability to know your strengths and your weaknesses and your ability to to look inside yourself um and and the best way to be more aware of, of your self-awareness is by self-reflecting and I gave those three easy examples or simple examples. Um, and anybody who's read my books will say they're, they're easy to read books. And that's exactly my goal is to make it simple. And, you know, self-reflecting, as I mentioned, those three questions, what did I do well today? So we look at the positives. Uh, the second question is, what could I have done better today? So it could have been a conversation you had in the, in, with somebody that, um, maybe you spoke to them in a manner that maybe wasn't the best, for example, well, at least you're reflecting on that, that you can do better next time. What would you do? What would you do, do differently next time? And then the third question is very much linked to my purpose of growing and helping others is who did I make better today? Uh, because this journey that I'm on of excellence is not just about myself. It's more about others. It's more about growing others. That's what leadership is. That's what, coaching is that's what management is is it's it's not about you it's about others when, when was that mindset shift for you in terms of having that seeing success as that inner feeling rather than maybe a metric or an external uh outcome when when did that you said 10 years then you said 10 years ago you kind of you shifted your outlook towards um mm. your purpose was was there a bit of a light bulb moment for you was was, was there something that kind of yeah made look, you change I would say in my 20s and 30s, maybe to mid 30s, chasing success was very much about me. Uh, who would be my next world world class athlete I'd train, work with? Uh, who would be the next best team I'd work with? So on and so forth. So that's chasing success. Um, so what did it change for me was just, I suppose it's just after after 15, 20 years of, of, of this chasing, um, I, I didn't feel any more fulfilled or any more joy in what I was doing. You know, having worked with Grand Slam champions and, you know, PGA champions and, and Olympians, uh, they'll tell you that, you know, when you win that medal or you're standing on top of that podium, that feeling doesn't last very long. You know, you know, you work all your life to win something big, a gold medal at the Olympics or, or a Grand Slam a victory of a grand slam title and then you know the, every single one of them will tell you like a day or two afterwards it's just like okay well is that it all right uh you know you worked all your life for that and that's that's all that's all what it feels like and that's why the journey is so much more important that's why chasing excellence in my in my opinion is is much more important is that you're you're competing against yourself in a healthy way you're not always competing against others and in a way that also shifts your your personality as well is that you you're 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 happy for other success because when you're chasing success and you're competing all the time 
it always just feels like a competition and that's where jealousy can creep in or uh you know why are they why are they doing so well what have they done you know and 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 for me it's now a shift of what are they doing so well how can i learn from them uh you know what questions can i ask them i think that's another thing as well maybe it comes with age christian and 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 is your ability to keep open minded and your ability to learn from absolutely anybody and everybody um i learned from teenagers i learned from coaches leaders that have maybe only been in the, in the industry for a year or two everybody has something to teach you yeah. you you're never the complete package and and uh, and i think my book seven keys to being a great coach you know i never want to be known as an expert you know and they say well this this person's an expert in a and b and no i mean i'm i'm a learner uh you know if i look back at the person i was 5 years ago i've i'm ch- i've changed if i was to probably pose that question to you uh, christy are you the same person you were 5 years ago you'd probably say no you've you've also changed I, in fact i hope you have because that means that you're you're learning and you're growing and you're you're maybe changing some beliefs and you're changing some values and standards the way the more you go on so the more you learn the more you grow the more people you meet uh the more things change in your in your beliefs and your values and your standards hopefully for the better you mentioned some of the athletes that you've worked alongside or worked with in terms of elite performance um what habits do they have that and uh, that make them top end performers in their in their field is there certain traits or is there is there a common theme across a range of different sports or even you know you mentioned businesses and other industries is there is there any common traits or any habits that they they hold that you've you've noticed during your time as a as a uh, consultant a practitioner a, a learner yeah I would, I would say that they they have they know what they want which is one of the first questions i ask um the clients i consult athletes uh business people in the corporate world is what is it you want you've got to have clarity on that so if it's an athlete it's it's pretty easy some most of the time because they they know what they want they either want to be if they're an, an elite professional athlete they want to be a world champion or they want to be an olympic champion or something so it's clear and cut so there has to be clarity first of all so i would say clarity and vision clarity in what they want so that's leaders coaches managers for example um i'd also say they have a monomaniacal focus on 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 what they want as well so they're very focused when they need to be they're able to to really tap in as well i'd say they have that uh they have a hunger and passion for 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 what they want or for what they do that's important i believe you got to love if you want to be successful in something uh or be the best at something you've got to love it because even if you love something and you're passionate about it like i'm passionate about what i do but there's a lot of things i don't like to do uh that involve it uh, do you like doing taxes? Do you like doing admin? No, it's part of what I do as well, my job. Uh, but I love what I do, 80, 80% of it. Um, I'd also say uh, self-discipline is a high one as well. You've got to have discipline if you want to be great at something or good at something. Um, and then when it comes to athletes, if we're going that way, I'd say the ability to control emotions, the ability to handle pressure situations better. Um, you know, you have a look at look at the very best athletes of why the Federers, the Nadals, the Messies, they always perform on the big stage. They hardly ever don't. Of course, they're human. They can have bad moments, bad days. Uh, but their, their, their ability to handle the bigger moments the pressure moments is they they have that 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 would definitely be a key one so yeah to to summarize i think that was five things i think it was uh uh a, a monomaniacal focus it was clarity in what they want vision um a hunger and a passion for what they do like i said you're not always going to love what you do but it's part of it um the ability to to handle the pressure and also um, self discipline is crucial. So those would be the things. Can those traits be learned? Because there's a lot of argument around nature versus nurture. Some people say that people are born to succeed in a certain 
field or be a leader or be an expert. I'm, I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts on whether you can develop those skills uh, over time um, and kind of educate yourself on to become more self-disciplined or more um, have, have more clarity or have more sense of direction are, are those. How do we build that within ourselves? Is, is that something that we can, we can improve? I'm sure we can all improve that, but is there anything that we can do to, to kind of develop that as, 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 as people in general, whether that's in, whether that's in sport or whether that's in any other field, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I would I would get back to clarity and knowing what you want, first of all. So where do you want to be better? Why do you want to be better is also an important question as well and what you're doing. So you've got to, you, because motivation fleets. So it's important that you have a good enough reason of why you want to improve in this particular area, wherever wherever it may be. Um, I'm I'm under the belief of the 80 20 is that you're 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 born you're born and um you spoke about nature and, and nurtured uh, you know it's 80 20 you 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 need to be lucky as well with with like i said you can't choose your parents but lead, let's just look at leadership for example there's got to be some leadership qualities in the home um as well where there's an example and what's your example for your first 10 15 18 years before you leave home are your parents their leadership qualities uh, how you how they handle crises, how they handle pressure, um, how they how they deal with things. So there you there there's already an advantage. If we look at athletes, genetics as well as is having the right genetics helps helps a lot. But I would say eighty percent of it is definitely the work that you put in. Um, so I'd say you're born twenty percent uh, with the with the abilities and the qualities, and and eighty percent of it really comes down to you the work you, that 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 you put in. Um, again it's it's something that uh how invested are you how badly do you want it how much are you how many books are you willing to read a year how many uh podcasts videos you're learning to to uh, willing to listen to and watch for example now i'm a lot older than you but you know growing up we didn't have podcasts until really 2005 maybe i'm not too sure and even those you know it's funny is that when podcasts started they didn't really take off they didn't really fly yeah uh no it really only came into existence around about 2010 2015 of like oh podcasts okay now most people you speak to listen to podcasts uh but back then it wasn't really really so much the case so you know now now this generation has such an an advantage of learning so quickly uh, like what we're doing right here, right now, for example, I would have, I would have I wished that, you know, 20 years ago, I'd just be able to get someone on a podcast and just start asking them questions and expert in their field. Now we have that advantage. We have that ability. Um, for me, I, I love it personally because I'm sharing. So maybe today when I ask myself that third question, who did I help today? Hopefully I've helped some people listening to this podcast right now. Um, I always believe as well as that when I when I speak publicly or I write a book, if you just learn one thing from listening to this podcast or a podcast, reading a book, listening to somebody in a seminar or conference, if you just learn one thing, it's been worth it. Even if you had to go through 300 pages or you had to sit through four hours of a boring lecture or speech, but then there was just one or two things that stuck out for you that have helped you in your career or helped you move forward in your relationships or helped you move forward in your life. It's been worth that time. Even just one thing. I get the feeling that mindset is a privilege then in terms of what we're discussing. Mindset is a choice. It's a, well, it's a, it's a choice, but, but I think if you, if you can, if you can understand those choices, you you onto a winner, I, I presume, from your perspective, especially in terms of what you've mentioned, yeah, on the yeah, podcast yeah, and within and, your and, books, yeah. And Christy, I want to I want to you know say that again is is some have, you know not everybody is given an equal start in life, but we do get to choose our our direction thereafter, and it's not easy, you know. Uh, sometimes it's hard to relate to people that have that you know saying things are easy but you know they've been they've had a cushy life they've had been to the best schools they've been put through the best colleges 
you know, they've been given a head start and an advantage. And, and, you know, that's not, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's not nothing. Um, I'm not saying that's unfair, but, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for people that really had to work for things and, and, and have that champion mind, for example, of, of, of struggle in a way, because it makes you appreciate it more. And, and, um, yeah, it just develops, develops grit, develops resilience. Mm, that there's, um, Alice says there's a really good documentary on Netflix called South of the River. Um, it's about uh, grassroots football in London, and they mention the the hardship in South London, but how many players eventually do and make it elite, do go on to make it elite performers in the Premier League. That there's, oh, there's, okay. there's a there's a there's a there's a majority, especially in England, that have come from the same area in South London, and it kind of resembles to your point around. Um, while she might, while she might not think that you're fortunate because of your economics um, environment, it actually has influenced you to be more passionate and more determined to, to kind of come away from the environment that you're in. So it gives people more drive, more determination to go on and pursue a career, whether that's in elite sport or whether that's in oh, cool. other sports. And it kind of just resembles your point there. I, it, it kind of just strung to mind really just because i watched that recently and again it relates to what you said i think it's uh especially what's it called again south of the river south of the river it's called yeah south uh yeah yeah okay um but but my point is is that that can actually determine you to to be more focused or put more energy into one thing just to try and build a career build an outlet for yourself um it's very much emphasized within that documentary yeah you know you know we spoke about one of the points of of succeeding is hunger and passion but you know talking about hunger in a literal point of view or you know i was brought up in south africa where uh i would do cross country and running races and there, there would be a lot of uh black kids from underprivileged backgrounds that would come to to races for example um with no shoes and and run on on the hot tarmac and or or, or on the dirt or or the, the the fields which was let me tell you thorns stones everything and you know in some of these races for example uh there'd be first prize would be like 20 pounds or you know equivalent to 20 pounds or 20 dollars and you know it's just like kenya as well you know where you they're basically running to put food on their table um so you know there's a definition of hunger for you as well yeah. is that it's all or nothing, you know, uh, in terms of they, they need to eat tonight. So, you know, it's, it's all sides of life. It's important to really mm. just expose yourself to all sides of life. You know, one of the things I do every week is I volunteer at a soup kitchen, which is, is um, providing food for, for the homeless. Um, uh, so it's a shelter here in my city in Boynton Beach in, in Florida. And that is one of the most rewarding things as well. You know, we sometimes got to remind ourselves of how fortunate we are in life. So I'd really encourage, you know, everybody listening, if you can give one day out of a month, if it's one day out of a week, fantastic, uh, which I'm which I'm doing at the moment, it's the most rewarding thing is to give back and also just realize that, you know, one day we could be on the other side of that line. We could be on the other side of that counter. Um, you know, I have a lot of conversations with, with these, these people as well. And, you know, some of them were successful in business. Some of them had, you know, families, kids, life, which just things went, went, went wrong. Um, you know, so it's very important for us to, to keep that in mind. Hmm. I, I get the sense gratitude is very important to you. Yes, uh, for, for sure. More and more and more. Um, just like the shift, you know, we spoke about 10 years ago for me, I'm saying plus minus 10 years. I don't know exactly when it was, but it was probably about that uh, of success, chasing success. And it's all about me and what I get and, and so on. And, and now it's rather like, it's not focused on what I'm getting, but who I'm becoming as a mm. person. And I'm nowhere near the person I want to be. So it's important to know your future self. What do you want your future self to be, to look like? write that down but yes gratitude is massive it's a it's a it's a game changer it's a shift and it's very easy you know even if you started just with one thing a day 
to ask yourself a question in the morning, you know, uh, what am I grateful for today? Could be anything. Waking mm. up, um, breakfast, uh, a warm bed that I slept in last night. More than 60% of the world don't have that. You know, so you just start there. In terms of environment then, and some of the people that you've worked with uh, in terms of high performance across a range of different sports, um, and also people might, might be listening to this podcast, there might be business owners, there might be people in different fields away completely from the sporting environment. Um, my question to you, Alistair, is how do we create a high performance culture to ensure that everyone's working successfully uh, working towards the aims of the company or the goals that are set out by an organization. How do we develop a, a, a culture that is positive and successful? Well, a high performing culture starts with a high, high performing leader. So it all starts at the top. It starts with the leader. The leader sets the temperature, the leader, leader sets the tone from the leader comes the vision and the type of culture that he or she envisions. So first of all, th those are the most two important things is, is the leadership, the character of the leader. And the second thing is clarity in, in the vision and in, in what you want your culture to look like. So once you have those two things established, once you, once you know what your culture uh, is going to look like, that helps you recruit, hire, and source the right people for the culture that you have. So that's where that's where the starting basis is of a high performing culture is. So uh, leadership, clarity in the vision, clarity in, in the culture that you want helps you re uh, recruit the right people. And that's where it starts as well as then having the right people. Um, your culture are your people. So, you know, I can give you an example of you walking into a coffee shop and they might have the best coffee, the best cake, but they have rude uh employees employees the service is terrible um it's the, the the tables aren't cleaned now that's their culture okay are you going to want to go back there probably not so you would probably go somewhere where maybe the coffee is okay but you know when you walk in the door they say hey christy good to see you again how's things going at you know, wherever you work or wherever you study, for example, you're you're more than likely going to go back there. So that's what culture is, is people and behaviors uh, and, and the way that you're treated, the experience you have. That's another great word for a culture is how is your experience? How is your experience at that coffee shop? How is your experience at the academy? How is your experience at uh, whatever it may be? So that's that's the starting blocks right there is it starts at leadership you can't have a healthy culture a thriving culture high performing culture whatever you want to call it with toxic leadership it's impossible no matter what systems you have in place no matter what your facilities look like it doesn't matter if you have toxic leadership or ineffective leadership you won't have a high performing culture so it starts there and then everybody is bought into the vision. Everybody has, there's clarity in, in that as well. And then having the right people, um, that's where it starts. And then from there, we can go into many other things like systems, uh, community standards, values, the way we communicate, uh, all these things, you know, we can, we can go down the list in terms of all the other things that need to fall into place. You said toxic leadership. What does toxic leadership look like? Can look in many 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 forms um it can be self self motive for example as well the the person's in it for themselves uh uh autocratic leadership as well in terms of do as i say and not not, not as i do uh you know there's a difference between a boss and a leader uh, a, a boss uh, sits at the top and points his finger and commands everybody to do things a leader goes with his or her her people uh, shows them the way uh, as well a leader is a coach um, as where a boss is to someone that you know barks out instructions, for example. So toxicity lies in in um, in behaviors, and uh, and 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 that's obviously where where poor cultures uh, stem from. Is where is just that toxic toxic leadership and behavior. Interesting. I, I spoke to um, a professional footballer who was a guest on this show um, who played in the second tier in England, uh, which is the Championship. 
Um, and he mentioned that there was a coach that came into the football club for a short period of time. And his words were, he was only in it for the money and it impacted the team collectively. There was groups, there was, he, there was, there was kind of certain pockets within the, in the dressing room. It impacted the culture in terms of, um, the player didn't want to play for the manager and it caused that toxic element as you kind of alluded to then. Um, and it's just interesting to hear your point. And it kind of really relates to that experience of of that professional footballer and how apparent it happens. Um, we, we know it's bad, but it seems to be an occurrence in, in in certain pockets within elite sport. Yeah, not just in sports either, but uh, you know, a lot of the time in corporate as well. Um, you know, where that toxic that toxic leadership is there, and like you just said, in for the money and. You know, it's 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 also very important to know what motivates people, why that why they're there. Um, you know, great coaches are able to tap into people's motivation, what motivates them, how do how do I get the best out of them? You know, so for example, if we were working together, Christy, I'd want to get to know you very well. I'd want to to get to know you as a person, not how you work, not what you do, but you know, about you. What motivates you? What do you like? What don't you like? What what lifts your spirits, you know? Um, all these things are important for, for me to know as a leader that I can tap into those and get the best from you as well. So, um, yeah, that's, um, yeah, those are important things to know. Is, is there ever, ever a struggle with leaders going into other countries and understanding the cultural aspect there? Does that ever become a challenge? Have you ever come across anyone that has, has, has maybe gone from, for example, if they were in the UK and started to work in, in Europe where the language is different, the lifestyle different, and you're trying to build a holistic method to to build a culture, but there are some differences. Is, is Have you ever come across anything around that? Because there's a big emphasis, especially in English football, that there's a that, that there's more coaches now moving abroad to Scandinavian countries. You know, Graham Potter, who's the Chelsea manager, prime example of that and learning about leadership in a different way and then bringing that back. Have you come across anything similar in that sense around different cultures and different environments? All the time, all the time. Culture is a massive thing. You know, understanding the culture that you're going into is one of the key aspects of, of, of being a success in it and being, um, uh, doing, doing well in it, for example, as well, you know, it's so important that, you know, you just mentioned their language as well. You know, one of the, you know, I, I work with a, a few top fo- football teams in the world as well. And it still fascinates me some of the recruitment of of certain coaches and managers who can't speak the language properly, um, you know, and they have interpreters and they have people and, and so on. So uh, it, it communication is, is, is massive. I put it right up there is that effective communication. Um, you know, if, if we can't speak the same language, it's very, very hard to communicate our thoughts, our feelings. And also, if even if we learn, um, you're still not learning that type of in-depth communication. Does that make any sense? Yeah, we're, we're, simply, yeah. we're simply communicating. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so, so, so that's massive, I believe, for example. So, you know, when I'm helping with recruiting, something I do here in the United States is I help coaches and athletic directors recruit athletes to, to colleges as well. And, you know, we look at obviously the main one being they've got to have the skill set. You know, so we say your skills are the the entry ticket, but your attitude determines how far you go. So if I was to, if we were to have one spot available on the team and there's two athletes of equal skill and they're similar results, who are we going to go for? The one with the better attitude, the one that's that's able to to work together in a team. That's the one that we're going to choose over the other one, even if the other one's maybe five percent better the results are slightly better we're still going to go for the character first and in terms of that so you know yes uh, culture is massive communication the language also just understanding their their ways as well um that's why i always say you know when you go into a new position a new job listen observe ask questions don't go in there trying to change the world and, and trying to change everything about it. You are going to see things, you know, you don't like that need to be changed, but you, a great leader knows they don't do that straight away. Um, you know, you look at Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool. It took him two and a half years, three years to get, to get the team going in the way he wanted it to. 
because there were certain people he needed to get off the bus. There are certain people he needed to get on the bus. And it takes time. Um, I believe a great culture takes three to five years. Three, you know, but <laughs> we know you just spoke, you just brought up football there. You're not given three years yeah. unless you are a marquee name, a Guardiola, a Klopp. You are given a bit more time to have two or three bad seasons. And then, you know, it gets restless, but the rest don't have that time. You're given now in the premiership, for example, you're given one and a half seasons if you're lucky, or some are given less. You know, we look at Lampard, for example, where, and the pressure's on again. Unfortunately, I like him, but it's just so quickly uh, of how it turns. Um, but that's for another show. We could talk about <laughs> premiership management in another, yeah. another show for sure. So you kind of my next it kind of leads to my next question really around pressures and and staying resilient. So I can imagine you use the example of Frank Lampard and the the media are probably on top of him at the moment and there's a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. But people in other industries might have different pressures that they have to kind of cope with. So is there any strategies that you you've come across with you know your clients that have made them think differently on how to deal with stresses and pressures and how to stay resilient in a, in a distracted world. Is there anything that you've come across within that, that is relevant? You know, self-leadership is number one in terms of you have to take care of yourself if you want to take care of others. And in those high pressure environments and jobs that we've just spoken about and you've just mentioned is that it's difficult because, you know, there's, you know, there's two matches a week or, or, you know, every week you're judged you're, you know, in the premiership, you're only three matches away from getting fired. It, it, it happens that quickly or being on the firing list. Uh, you know, three losses in a row is alarm bells. So, you know, dealing with, first of all, is that you got to take care of yourself because, you know, you can run yourself into the ground. And I don't know if you've ever seen as well with, you know, they've done that thing with um, presidents of the United States and even of, of the United Kingdom. Uh, prime ministers, I think they, they call it yeah. their. Um, where you look how much they've aged over their term, you know, over four years or over, over eight years, for example. And so because of stress, because of the pressure. And, uh, you know, Jurgen Klopp was joking about it as well, of like saying, gosh, if you look at my first uh, press conference of how young I looked <laughs> and how much <laughs> this has taken out of me. And he's not joking there. It It really it wears on you. It's heavy on you. So self-leadership, taking care of yourself, knowing when you, you need to step away, knowing when you need a break. Uh, when you're under pressure and stress, it affects everything. Relationships, uh, your health, stress, everything. It affects everything. So you've got to be aware of that. That's why I believe it's good that, and you know, I I'm, I can't mention these names because of confidentiality, but I work with two premiership managers and and two in the Scottish league as well, where um, it's more mentorship and 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 the support system. So even these great leaders and managers, they have a support system um, to 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 help them as well. They don't have all the answers, and that requires humility. That requires ability to listen, even when you are the big boss, for example. So they put those. Mo- a lot of them put those things in places where they'll have people to 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 support them, have the right people around them. Um, you know, so for example, I will watch a lot of their press conferences and I'll give them feedback of, you know, how they maybe could have handled a certain question better or so on and so forth, because stress comes out at those times. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it, self-leadership is, is very important. Um, also, just knowing when you need to step away sometimes uh, and also seeking the right advice, mentorship. What happens if someone doesn't have a mentor and they want to develop self-leadership? Any strategies or, or, or ideas there? Yeah, going back to where we started, uh, self-awareness. And self-awareness helps with your emotional intelligence. Self-awareness helps you become a better human being, which helps you become better in, 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 you know, that's the foundation of your work as well. So I would start there as simple as that. A lot of people think you've got to be doing complicated things and and so on, but really self-awareness is, is the basis of knowing yourself better. I wish 
I'd had more self-awareness 20 years ago. I probably would have been further along. So if I can give advice to anybody right now in their 20s, 30s, <laughs> whatever age, is practice self-awareness. Um, you know, ask yourself two or three questions a day, as I just mentioned as well. Start there to become a better person. Um, and, you know, read a lot. Uh, listen to podcasts. Those are things that, that I do every single day. Um, if I go for a run for a half an hour, I'm listening to a podcast. If I'm, if you know, I read every morning, that's a habit that I have as well. I read at least 20 minutes in the morning. If I have more time and I don't have a meeting, um, I'll read longer. So those are the best, seriously, those are the best ways. You know, they say leaders are readers. And I haven't met, and, and I, I work with CEOs of large companies and some successful people there in the UK as well. And they're all readers. They all read about at least 30 to 40 books a year. Did you say you got a seventh book on its way? Is that correct? Yeah, but I've, I've just started that. So <laughs> <laughs> the sixth one just came out a month ago. So. so in terms of maybe a collective of the ones that you've done already, um, anyone listening or watching this, um, what are the biggest takeaways from, from the the book. So the one that I've read is the, uh, the champion minded book. So can you kind of elaborate on some of the ideas within the books that you've put together and, and what was your inspiration on, 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 um, on, on putting down ideas in, into paper? Yeah, I would, yeah, I would say the first one, seven keys to being a great coach is, is really the things I've learned on my coaching journey. So I had 20, 25 years on working with professional athletes on the tennis tour, PGA golf, soccer, rugby teams, you name it, um, cricketers. And these are all athletes that played at, at the highest level, World World Cup, World Champions. Um, so my experiences and mistakes I made in coaching, um, what I learned from other coaches. So, uh, you know, some well-known people in, in that book as well that I mentioned where certain things that I learned from them. Um, second book champion minded is for the athlete. It's more just tools for the athlete in terms of what we just spoke about, the things that require zero talent, work ethic, attitude, uh, time management, communication, all that. As you, as you know, from that book, it's a very easy read. Um, the third book, uh, becoming a great team player gets into culture more of how to be a, the, the title says it all, how to be a great team player, how to work with others. Um, fourth book was, uh, developing a winning attitude and mindset. So how do you do, how do we develop the right thoughts, the right habits? Um, how do we build relationships effectively? All these things. Uh, the fifth book, uh, lead with purpose, make an impact is on leadership. Again, very short, simple chapters. So regardless what stage you are in, in your leadership journey, uh, you could be just starting out or you could be well into it. It's a great book just to remind yourself of the important qualities of a leader, uh, adaptability, communication, relationships, all these things. Um, and then my my last book, uh, Habits That Make a Champion, is very similar to Champion Minded. It's for the athlete. And it's 50 short uh, chapters, five-minute reads on uh, on the habits that that it requires to be to be a champion. A lot of the things that we actually just spoke about on – on this conversation now would you say that a lot of the artifacts within those books are from your observations have you found yourself being a very good observer during your career better and better because i i realized that effective communication wasn't about talking it was about listening um <laughs> yeah so a great communicator is a great listener uh, you know in seven keys of being a great coach i say become an 80 20 listener to to talker you're going to learn a lot more and you're going to learn a lot more about your athlete or the person that's standing in front of you to, to help them instead of you talking and thinking that, you know, all, all the answers. So uh, for sure, um, being a, being a great listener is, is a, is a, is a great, you know, there's a reason why we have one mouth and two ears, you know, listen <laughs> twice as much as you speak. <laughs> so Alice, the final question. Um, what I normally do is I normally get my guests to, to look back but I think with you it'd be nice to kind of look forward because you've kind of mentioned within our conversation some of the things that you might have done differently or you would have changed um during the time of your your career so when your time comes to an end and you you kind of retire and put your feet up you mentioned you're in Florida so enjoy the the weather in Florida <laughs> and chill out um 
what would you like to see your your legacy to be and what do you think the future of maybe sport performance or high performance looks like is it is there anything that you you might think might pursue in the future or some of the things that might kind of play out in the long term anything any ideas on that um i haven't really thought about my legacy but i just want to just continue uh impact and inspire other people to to get the best out of themselves as simple as that sounds again why the word excellence is big for me as you can see anybody who's watching on video uh this is one of my favorite quotes is excellence is an attitude which it is it all starts with with your attitude excellence um so yeah to inspire and impact as as many as possible i can't put a number of that it's impossible but anybody that's listening again if there's one thing you heard today or written a book that's moved you forward in your life, your relationships or your career. For me, that's a win. Um, you know, they say to change the world, you've got to change yourself first. So continually, uh, I, I want to keep working on myself. So I don't think I'll ever retire uh, because I'll continually want to keep learning and growing and sharing. Uh, does that mean I'm still traveling the world as much or writing as many books? I don't know. But some of my greatest influences and mentors are are well into their 80s now. And one of my greatest mentors, Nick Boletari, just passed away three weeks ago at, at 91, who was a dear, dear friend. And I learned so much from him. Uh, so, you know, and, and these were these were men that were still or people that were still learning up until the very last day and sharing, which is for me, I aspire to be that. I aspire to be that if I'm given another 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it may be, we don't know. Um, but that would definitely be for me my my goal. And then the second part of your question was regards um how I see the industry changing. Was that it? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Well, I think it's you know, with with so much technology and so much access to um inside information and you know we we see just like you mentioned there netflix and and you know shows like all uh all or nothing where we get into the locker rooms the offices the meetings of of these things that we never could before we're going to we're going to be exposed to a lot more Our, the leadership will need to step up uh the generations are changing all the time so, you know, we've gone from an agricultural generation to an industrial generation to now a technological generation. So mindsets have changed. The way of living has changed. The way of communication has changed. Uh, so we have to adapt. We have to keep adapting. One of the things that uh, another mentor of mine, Coach K of, of Duke Basketball, you know, when I was speaking to him one afternoon in his office and, you know, I, I pushed him for a, a question. I said, you know, what is the, the one key thing of a great coach? And, you know, of course, it's a stupid question because, well, is, there's no such thing as stupid questions, but there's many keys to being a great coach. But he said adaptability, the ability to adapt to people, the ability to adapt to change. And this was this was about two weeks before COVID started. So what a great time <laughs> for me to get that message from a, from a, a, a legend like Coach K, Mike Krzyzewski of Duke basketball, of the ability to adapt. And we know with COVID, we had to adapt. It wasn't, it wasn't easy, but I would say, um, I would say those things moving forward. Yeah. Alistair, thank you so much for your time today. You've been a huge inspiration and I uh, really enjoyed listening to you. Um, where can listeners find you social media? Is that right? Yeah, um, Instagram. I I really just use the platform to share some inspiration and po positivity and quotes. So uh, that's at, at B Champion Minded. Uh, and then Twitter. I'm a massive uh, massive fan of Twitter. I love that. It's one of the first things I check in the morning, and that's my name at Alistair McCall. Um, those are probably the two best areas uh, to to <laughs> to stay in touch. And then you know I have my podcast, the Alistair McCall podcast. However, I need to. I need to uh, update that and do a show. It's It's been a, a crazy six months as well. So uh, yeah, those would be the best places. What we'll do, Alistair, is we'll put all those links into the description and also links to your books as well. So if anyone's listening or or uh, watching this on, on the YouTube channel, they can, they can go and check that out. That, once again, thank you so much. Um, it's You're been most welcome. Thanks, thanks so much for having me and all the best for, for the year. Thank you.